So here we are in London, we're in the company of John Ilsley, legendary bass player with Dire Straits, and now uh, a long-standing bass player. John, it's been 25 years, 26 years since uh, Dire Straits wound up as a going concern. Yeah. And this is now, I think, your ninth solo album coming up for air. Yeah. yeah. That's, quite, that's quite a journey. Uh, yes, I don't know, I'm not quite sure where they come from. <laughs> Sort of drop out of the sky into your lap sometimes. No, I'm kidding. Uh, but uh, yes, uh, I think it's out of those nine, there's probably six which are sort of proper studio albums, and there's a, a couple of live things and uh, a DVD and such like, you know, other other contraband. And uh, I, I know that um, the, the previous solo album that, you know, took some time to come out because uh, you had some some health uh, concerns you were dealing with. So is yeah. this the first album you? You've kind of recorded with kind of a clean bill of health, in a happy state of mind, and has that informed kind of the songs on the album? Well, Testing the Water was really the, the, uh, the, the one after, um, which was the, um, that was the third album, or second album, I thought, I can't remember that. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, I, I, I had to get rid of a, a leukaemia problem, and um, um, when I came out, I found, I, I, I took a guitar into the hospital with me, and uh, was working on songs while I was in there, which is quite interesting. So that's why the song is, uh, the, the album is really a sort of a, um, a sort of a, a document of that time. Um, you know, things like uh, railway tracks, which is, uh, life doesn't always run on railway tracks, as we know. Um, yeah, so uh, most, most albums are really about where you are at a particular time, like this one. Uh, you know, coming up for air, which in, it says something about the title. <laughs> <laughs> and it's it's intriguing. So it's a seven-track album. Comes in. It's kind of an old-style album. It comes in at, at a little over thirty minutes. Yeah. But I found it very immersive. Listen, it, it seemed to, you know, seemed like a much longer album when you listen to it, and that's that's supposed to be a compliment. <laughs> well, I didn't want to put any any flab in it or slack, so I. Although I'd had about three other things that I could have put on, they weren't quite ready. And I, you know, there comes a point when I just like to get something finished. You know, I don't really want to have it sort of sitting around too long. So because the energy, as you're making an album, I find the energy sort of starts to ebb a little bit. And these were the seven songs which were making more sense than anything else. And they give it. They had a. They have a sort of a. There's a sense of continuity and. Um, so cohesiveness about the album, which I like, um, and some of it's very reflective of, of the old days, like old Amsterdam. You know, when we first went to Holland to receive a, an award. You know, that was a very a moving moment because, considering we were still living in a council flat, um, is that down in Deptford. Yeah, down in Deptford, yes, <laughs> sunny Deptford, which apparently now is being gentrified. Um, <laughs> I don't like believe everything else. you read. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes. Well, uh, everything changes, doesn't it? Nothing stays the same. Uh, those old blocks of flats we lived in are still there, but there's now trees around them, so that always changes things a little bit. You know, nice touch. And um, in terms of trees and groves, the album was recorded at British Grove, Mark Knopfler's studio. It was. Uh, well, it was finished off there. I, I did a few of the vocals there and, and mixed it there because um, I, I, actually I used three studios. The first one was where I put the basic tracks down, which was my keyboard player studio near Ringwood, and then I took it to Guy Fletcher's studio in Chichester, mm -hmm. and um, which I've worked in many times before. And Guy helped me, you know, fine tune a few things, as he's very good at. And then Guy and I moved up to British Grove to do the mixing for about two and a half, three weeks. And because when you get to British Grove, because of the excellence of the uh, the the um, studio everything works so you know when you go in there you know exactly what you're going to be listening to when you come out and it's a so it's a very safe place to be for me and I've mixed actually recorded two of the albums completely there and I've mixed all of them there mm -hmm. um, so I, I know what it's supposed to sound like I think what's what's great for long-standing admirers of, of your your music and your writing is that you and Mark still have a, a great ongoing relationship post the band. Yeah, we're kind of old mates, really. More like drinking partners and like <laughs> a couple of grumpy old men getting together and sorting the world out, you know. But, uh, you know, we're, we're good. We're good. And it's it's a, a very enjoyable relationship, actually. 
and uh, almost some of some of the people that are involved with him musically are involved with you as well. Well, Guy, yes, particularly. I mean, uh, you know, he's 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 worked on pretty much all of my albums actually, um, and he's I consider him a good friend, and uh, we even play golf together. <laughs> Which sounds terribly middle class, but you know. <laughs> and. Uh, just in terms of the, of the the legacy of the band that you're you're in, that the people people recall, um, Mark I know doesn't play very much in terms of the old catalogue. So it sounds like he's almost happy that the, the people like yourself that are honouring the legacy of the music. Is that is that fair? Do you know I, I, I doubt whether he even thinks about it. To be honest, he's very much his own man. Um, he's done more solo albums than we did together as the Straits. Uh, he's had the same band for 20 years, pretty much. That touring yeah. band he's got, there's some members that they've been for 20 years. So um, I think you'll probably find on this tour, he's maybe playing a few more straight songs because I think he's probably not going to, I don't know, I'm speaking out of turn here, but he's probably not going to do such a long tour again, I don't think. It's, 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 um, he'll probably back off a bit, I imagine. Yeah. But you know, when you've got so much material to choose from, it's really difficult to sit down and decide what you're going to play, even yeah. for me. I mean, it's, you know, you, you play for two hours, but you've got probably at least six hours of material you could choose from. Um, there's the obvious things that I like to play, and obviously some of my stuff that I integrate into the set, and there'll probably be more on this next these next few tours, because I've got a lot more material to work from. Mm. And uh, obviously we're playing songs from the new record, so... You know. and, and I know that there, I mean, there, there are other former members of the band that are, they're out doing their own kind of their own iteration. Yeah. Uh, Chris White is doing his thing. Um, I think he's the only original member of what he's doing. No, he's, it, not, he's not an original member. Let's just make oh, that quite straight for the for your public. Chris was a hired hand in the band. A very good hired hand. Great saxophone player. But he was not an original member. That's there's very only, true. There's yes. only four original members. That's Mark, myself, David, and Pick. Right? Everybody else was basically paid to be in the band. Let's make that quite categorical. So if anybody calls himself an original member, there's only four that can actually do that. That's absolutely fair. I, mean, I was going to say, re-listening to a lot of the early material, yeah. um, the pick had a, a real influence on, the, on, the, on that early, on the early the three, four hours. Absolutely. Albums, with that absolutely. jazz style, really open, Beautiful. leaving lots of space. Beautiful player. I think that you know his legacy on those first four Star Straits albums is, is really, really important, very important. And it was quite interesting when I first met him and we, we started playing together, it was like we'd been playing together for years. It was one of those seminal moments. There was no struggle, there was no effort, we just sort of locked in, it was like amazing. So that was easy, but he is a, he's a fantastic, beautiful drummer, beautiful drummer. And was he, a, he was an acquaintance that you introduced to, to David originally? Uh, no, uh, well, Mark and I and David were already fiddling around in, 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 um, in, the, in the council flat with a few ideas and we basically needed a drummer and, and Mark knew some of the lads from Newcastle who were living in this flat in North London somewhere and I think he, I think he rang up, I can't remember the name of the chap, one of the chaps from Lindisfarne I think it was. I can't remember his name now. Ginger hair. Anyway, um, I rang him up and said, you know, we're looking for a drum. Any ideas? And Pick was staying there. And so he said, well, Pick Withers is here. Oh yeah, I've heard of him. So we had to pay Pick's petrol to come down and give him some fag money, and then he came and played with us. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> and I mean, the reason why I mentioned the the early Straits lineup, the original lineup, as yeah. you rightly say, is that I think a lot of people who haven't heard maybe some of your solo albums um, and it struck me is that there is that kind of original, countryfied, widescreen but not too cinematic sound which comes across. Yeah. Was that, was, did that just happen or, or did you say to yourself, I really want to sort of go back to that kind of a um, more, more sort of basic open sound? Well, I didn't really have any other way of doing things. I mean, I've been doing, been doing that with the Straits for quite a few years, 16 to 17 years. And um, so when I came to do my own uh, albums, I mean, for instance, the first two albums, which I did when the Straits were 
still going, you know, that glass and never told a soul. I mean, that's, that's, you know, that's the way that I play. That's the way that I played on the Dire Straits stuff and the way that I play now. That's not going to change. You know, so uh, um, the fact that it sounds like that is because that's the way it should sound. And then if we maybe just take a look at some of the some of the tracks on the album, yeah, yeah, sure. I've had a good listen to this. Um, and it, as I said, seven tracks, but it, it, it flows really, really nicely. Um, I think, just looking at the track listing, the, the, the pairing coming up for air and so it goes, uh, they, they have got that sort of lovely mix of kind of making movies type of sound. A, li yeah. a little bit of the Brothers in Arms sound, but without this sort of the big Springsteen-like production that Jimmy yeah, brought yeah. to it. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's, there's a certain truth in that. I mean, So It Goes was a sort of a reflection of, of that time. Um, you know, we were doing a lot of touring and um, uh, we were in Buffalo, that, so that comes up in the song. And, you know, um, I, I wanted to get that sort of feel of that early that early Dire Straits um, element, you know, with the, um, the Tunnel of Love kind of feel. Yes. So I, I, I consciously did that. To, uh, I wanted to, to reflect that feel um, because it felt right for this particular song that I was writing. And then so, and then, and then I was just sitting with the keyboard player and I said, just play those chords, you know, those, but very slowly. And then I just put some bass notes on it and just, you know, used different sort of root notes and different yeah. fifths and stuff to what it create that sort of atmosphere and it, it's it, you know you've just got to work away at something and then suddenly it takes shape and there's yeah. there's no mystery to it you just have to keep working on something until you say stop that's enough and the yeah. song will eventually say okay stop fiddling with me yeah. it's a bit like when you're painting the yeah. painting turns around and says that's enough stop putting <laughs> paint all over me just leave yeah. me alone and it's um, Songs have a certain kind of life to them. I mean, you know, Mark's often talked about this, and I know exactly what he means. He said, once you've written that song, you kind of let it go. You know, it's off into the it's off into the into the public domain. It's gone. You've you've let it go now. You've, yeah. you, it's escaped your control in a way, and then it's, then it's up to what, what everybody else thinks about it, interprets it. Mm. And um, what's the other one? So double time. I, I, again, that sort of harks back to kind of the raikudery type of sound that yeah. you had earlier on. Well, that's about really that's about getting old, really. <laughs> double time. You know, like, the funny thing about getting old is that life does speed up. It goes into double time. You know, you think, hang on, so it, wasn't it just winter? Where are we now? Oh, my God, we're halfway through the year. You know, and uh, oh my God, it's going to be autumn soon. And suddenly, uh, whether that's just because one is too busy, and we're all very busy lives these yeah. days. I think there's some something going on behind the scenes which is making everybody speed up. I, I reckon somebody's speeding the clock up myself. But so everything's going on in double time. So I wanted to try and reflect that, and, and then reflect reflect back to being a kid again. You know, you know, making rafts and mucking about in fields, and you know, just outside or playing all the time. Whereas most kids these days are on the computer. I mean, thank God there were no computers around then. I, you know, I learned how to cycle across dirt tracks and build rafts and half drown and all that kind of stuff and you know breaking bones and you know yeah. love a heart love you know love affairs and all about being a kid really and um i think compared to the, the early straights material what you have on this album although the, the, the core sound is the same you do have some great subtle atmospheric keyboards and you have jody lescott playing some great percussion yeah, double no. time is one way where it, it, Got some lovely fills, percussion fills. Yeah, well, she's a darling. I mean, I, funnily enough, she was on uh, my second album in 1988, would you believe? So that was quite a considerable amount of time ago. And um, this is this this is the second time I've used her. <laughs> 1988 and 2018. What's that? That's 30 years. <laughs> it's 30 years, yeah. And she, hasn't, she hasn't changed a bit. She's still amazing. And uh, she's still very busy. I saw her play with Swing Out Sister like uh, only a few months ago. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, she's still everywhere, but she's really like, such a great player. I think she's out with Dido at the moment, I think. <laughs> I think so, but she's, you know, she's a busy girl. It's difficult to get her, on, get, get her into the studio because she's always busy. Okay, so what else have we got? 
Wild One. I wanted to ask you about Wild One. Ah. So, who is the Wild One? Who are you writing about? <laughs> this is a Australian artist called Brett Whiteley. And I, I, I um, would like anybody who likes art to look, at, look Brett Whiteley up on the, on the internet because he's probably, one of, well, he's certainly the finest painter I think that's come out of Australia. He died in 1992. <coughs> I met him in 1982. We became very close. And um, I realized when I met him that I was in the, in the presence of a remarkable painter, and also a remarkable person. He was pretty quirky. He, was, he, he, he veered from alcoholism and heroin addiction in, into sobriety. He was continually batting around that. And he was a wild one. He was a wild guy. But he was an extraordinary person. And I was privileged to have known him for 10 years. And, uh, he died while we were on the road. It was one of the saddest things that have ever happened to me, I think. It was a dreadful thing. But um, he, left, he left behind a legacy of wonderful paintings. I mean, he was, a, he was an extraordinary artist. So, you know, do yourself a favor, check him out, Brett Whiteley, he's really good. So that's, I wanted, to, I wanted to write something about him, you know. I think I pretty much got it right. <laughs> yeah. and, and equally, uh, people that, are, that know you well, that follow your career and go to your website, etc., will know that you, you yourself are a, a long-standing artist, a painter as well. Yeah. Um, so tell me about that passion. That started about the same time that I started playing the guitar. Uh, I was fortunate enough at school to have a really fabulous art teacher who, you know, when you, when you get an inspiring um, teacher, it takes you down a road you least expect and um, he, sh he opened my eyes to look at the pictures and I, so I thought well I'd, I'd like to be an artist and then of course the music started to bubble away inside me and I started playing in a band and at school and, and one thing led to another and, and the art sort of slipped away and I, when the band, when the Dire Straits finished in 19... 94, 95 or whatever one thinks it finished, um, I said, right, I'm going to be a painter. So I just knocked a, knocked a studio together in London and it um, took me eight years to pluck up the courage to put a painting in front of somebody. And they said, no, nah. this was an agent, you know, a dealer. I said, no, no, John, you're not ready. Okay, right, another two years. No, nah, you're getting close. And uh, so I've been working at it, and I still do it now. It's a very solitary experience. I love doing it. It's, it's a, it, I need to do it. It takes me into a part of myself that I don't go into very often. You find things out about yourself, like when you're writing songs. It's a different kind of experience when you're painting a picture. Yeah. Similar thing, you start with a blank canvas. You know, when you're playing the guitar, there's nothing there apart from this. You get a blank canvas, you draw something on it, put some paint on it, suddenly the whole thing's like a like a piece of music. In that, in that way, they're similar, but in other ways, it's a very, very solitary moment, the painting. Um, and of course, with music, I take that sort of solitary idea to a band, and then it starts to come alive. And um, but looking at the cover art for your, your past albums, I think I recognize one of your paintings of a strap on, on one of the yeah. previous albums, but not on the latest album. No. Was there not one that fits, or...? I've, I've I've got a very good photographer who is very close to me. It's my mother-in-law, ah. <laughs> and my wife's mother is a really very good photographer. She's done about the last four album covers, I think. So she goes all over the world. That's that's the, the latest cover is is on uh, coming up for her is from Venice, as you can see. The last one was Long Shadows, which she filmed in a London street, and. Testing the Water was when she was in Mozambique. Uh, the Live in London album is, uh, is, was done at night time in London. So she's, she's a great photographer. And, and so she's the, my first port of call, you know, and I always find something in her collection. You know, this, this thing just leapt out of the computer at me, this, this image of Venice, because she's, she's sort of done a sort of time, time exposure thing on it. So it looks like slightly blurred. Mm -hmm. And I thought, yeah. That's good, I love that. That'll do.
And if we look back at your career, you were, you were quite a late starter. I mean, you started almost at 27, where a lot of rock stars, that's when they finished not only their career, but their life. So yeah, you yeah. started at 27. Yeah. And now, I think this year, you've got a really significant birthday coming up in June. Yeah, yeah, yeah I have, yeah. What, what are your thoughts about that? Uh, interesting. Uh, <laughs> Uh, being 50 is one thing, 60 is another, and then coming up to 70, you know, life goes on in double time, doesn't it? Um, yeah, it's, well, life has been very good to me. You know, I survived an illness, I've got a wonderful family, got some wonderful friends. You know, I, I'm doing what I want to do pretty much most of the time. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty, pretty happy with things right now. I mean, I'll, I'll always be frustrated because I think if you're not a frustrated, musician or an artist you don't create anything if it comes easy yeah what's the point you know you have to you know as, as Maggie Hamlin my art teacher tells me it's not supposed to be bloody Illsley it's not supposed to be bloody Ill, easy Illsley you know I said I oh, know it's not is it and um, so writing songs ain't easy I know Bob Dylan finds it very easy but I think most writers find it a bit of a journey and um, I think it always should be difficult I love the irony of your life where one of your first jobs was, a, if I get this right, was a timber export importer and you've ended up in the New Forest. Yeah, there's not many oak trees left there. They cut them all down to build some battleships. Um, yeah, that was the, I, had a proper, I had a proper job for three years. You know, yeah. And then I went to university. And if I hadn't made that decision to go to university, A, I wouldn't have met Mark. B, the band wouldn't have happened, and C, I wouldn't have been sitting here talking to you. So there you are. That's fate. And then, as part of fate, they, well, you ended up in the New Forest, and you became a publican. I became a I didn't become a publican. <laughs> I became a pub owner. I could see in this local pub a sense of community, and I bought it literally a year after I bought the house down there, and um, I've had it now for 30 years. And it's a, it's a place where all the locals come and hang out and meet up. I go down there two or three times a week to see that the beer's being poured properly. And, um, Quality control, very important. Very, very important. <laughs> I had to teach them how to pour the Guinness. They do that right now. Um, <laughs> you've got to go to Ireland to get a decent pint of Guinness, but that's not too bad at my pub. And um, yeah, it's called the East End Arms in Leamington. Give it a bit of a push. Not that they need it, it's pretty busy. But the locals are all lovely. They're, <laughs> Car mechanics, they're rabbit catchers, they're fencers, they're, um, oof, they're writers, you know, um, all sorts come down there, you know, local businessmen, and they all mix and chat in the public bar or out in the sunshine or whatever, it's lovely. It is a lovely part of the world, I've been down to Lymington and Key Haven. Yeah, um, beautiful, beautiful. And then across to Hearst Castle. Yeah, yeah, very nice. So, uh, yeah, recommend people adapt down on the south coast, that area, absolutely beautiful. Yes. It's a unique part of the world. I mean, it's, it's a little corner that is not too busy because the New Forest does get a bit hectic at times. But um, where we are is a little bit off the beaten track, so it's, it's, it's quiet, which is what I like. And then I guess the final thing related to the album is, is that you have um, some family members that are contributing to, to the album. Well, it was cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, both my daughters have got really lovely voices. Jess and Didi, and um, they sing great together. And that, coupled with um, Hannah Robinson, who sings with me now, uh, those three voices together, uh, I think they really add something to the record. Yeah, you're absolutely right, they do. And it's, it's, it was lovely to have them in the studio working. They always get a little nervous when I say, do you want to come and play on the album? And eventually they say, yes, all right, Dad. John Ilsley, it's been great talking to you. Just remind everyone that Coming Up For Air, the album actually came out in, in March, but I think one of the reasons we're here is there's a, a vinyl edition that's yeah. coming out very shortly in May. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah. people should look out for that, for well, High Fidelity Analog. Analog High Fidelity, yes, it's in, um, it's, it's out now, I think it came out actually on the 12th of May, I, I think that's when it came out. Where are we now? What day is it? 22nd. Yeah, that was quite good, yeah, 22nd, yeah. Yeah, uh, so it's been out for 10 days, and, yeah, and there's a few drifting out into the cosmos. And uh, touring-wise, you, um, you you did some Q&A tours, 
recently, yeah. tour dates recently, and I think you have some uh, uh, European dates coming up uh, in yeah. the near future. We're doing the Paradiso in um, Amsterdam, which is my 70th birthday present to myself, and with a few, hopefully a few guests come along. And you can play old Amsterdam as well. I intend to do that. <laughs> and um, then we're doing two weeks in Germany, two weeks in Spain, and then in November we're doing uh, some more Q&A around the UK. Oh, that, excellent. That rhymes. Q&A around the UK. <laughs> um, yeah, we're going all the way from Wavendon, in, in the stables in Wavendon, up to, down to Lyme Regis and places that have never been before. Yeah. Excellent. Well, so we'll look out for those dates. And, yeah. um, um, for now, we have the album to enjoy. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Cheers.